Hold on, it says unable to join. Hmm. So we'll get it working. Okay, there you go. All right. There we go. What's up, Instagram? There we go. I got my brother, Senator Corey McRae, on the line. Let's see how I can avoid any kind of echo. If you turn the volume down on, yeah, on your phone and then turn it down on the laptop just a little bit, we should be good. All right. For those of you following on Instagram, for those of you in the Zoom, or if you're on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, um, make sure you follow Senator Corey McRae. Make sure you follow Senator Corey McRae on IG and his handle there is uh, at Corey McRae. So at C-O-R-Y-M-C-C-R-A-Y, at, at, at Corey McRae. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Really appreciate it. This is- uh, no, I appreciate, the, I appreciate the opportunity, Khalil, seriously. Thank you, yep, yep, yep. So um, uh, a few things that I wanna just quickly quickly jump into. First, I wanna just tell a quick story about how you and I met. Um, uh, you know, we had seen each other at a few different functions, groundbreakings, ribbon cuttings, all those kinds of things. Um, but it wasn't until uh, well, we had ran into, and when I say we, I mean a, a community land trust on which uh, both Kiara and I serve on, on, the, on the board. We ran into a little bit of a hiccup. Um, we had applied for a grant for three houses to fix them up and make them permanently affordable houses. Uh, and the goal was to get $150,000 from the Department of Housing and Community Development of Baltimore City and put them into these three, three houses. So uh, we applied for the grant in March of 2019. Um, by September of 2019, we were awarded an award letter, which allowed us to, oh, my apologies, let me record this. Recording in progress. Boom, okay, now we're live. <laughs> um, we had applied for the grant in March of 2019. By September 2019, uh, we had the award letter saying, yes, the properties, your plan, the structure that, that, that you're looking to do, we accept it. We will award this, this opportunity, the $150,000 to you. Um, by, by June of 2020, it was almost like we hadn't received any communication. Um, and that's no, no disrespect to the Department of Housing and Community Development. They're great partners. Um, the reality is this is a new program. It was. Um, they hadn't set up any kind of real infrastructure around it. You know, this it's not like it's decades old and, and they had the processes in place. There were things that they were figuring out along the way. And we were one of the first people to win the, 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 the award. So, um, but in, in, in our haste, it had been about 14 months at this point with houses sitting vacant, the mortgage payments continuing to go out, interest, interest payments and all. Um, so we reached out to you. Um, and fortunately you were an advocate, a very strong advocate. Uh, and since the communication with, 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 with you and the Department of Housing, uh, we were able to get bi-weekly meetings like clockwork. Uh, we made progress. We got to the Board of Estimates. We got our final approvals. Uh, uh, and within a few short months, we were able to, to see those dollars come into the, the land, land trust. Uh, 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 and we have since uh, uh, built and sold one house, uh, built and, and we're listed for sale the second house. Um, so we're super excited about that. And, and thank you for all the work that you do for us uh, and for the 45th district. Yep, and thank you for your leadership, man. Like seriously, that's what it's gonna to take to move Baltimore City forward. I 100% agree, thank you. Uh, so for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Khalil Lukta, uh, co-founder of Charm City Buyers. We are a vertically integrated real estate development and education firm. Um, uh, we take pride in not only building high quality houses, but the most important aspect of what we do is we, we lift as we climb. And we firmly believe that uh, in order to move the city in a positive direction as a whole, it takes a lot of different people. It takes us, it takes people who are also doing, doing the work, who trust us to, to train them. Uh, those of you who are on Zoom, Next Gen Fam, what up? Um, uh, and it, it, it takes a lot of community partners and political partners like your, your, yourself. Um, so uh, uh, what I wanna do is jump into a quick bio of who you are, Senator McCray, and then um, we can transition to some of the questions um, that, that we have so we can learn a little bit more about what's going on in the 45th district. So on your screen here, uh, uh, you see the biography of, of Senator Corey McCray. Um, I'm not gonna read it line for line, but a few of the, the highlights here. Um, Corey McCray was elected 
to represent the 45th legislative district in the Maryland State Senate in 2018. Since that time, he has been named a legislator to watch by the Daily Record, Maryland Matters, um, and I'm sure a few others. <laughs> Additionally, Corey also serves as the first vice chair of the Maryland Democratic Party. Um, uh, Senator Corey McRae grew up here in Baltimore, um, and he was, he was uh, you know, he, his greatest resources, uh, he believes, are hardworking men and women in the area. Um, one thing that I learned recently is that uh, Senator Corey McRae is uh, a real estate developer. You know, he, he has a background in, in this type of work. So um, uh, by age of 19, he had become a member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Work Workers. So right in the field, in the trenches, knowing this stuff. By the age of 20, he was a homeowner. Uh, Corey continued to meet opportunity halfway, working his way through community college and, uh, and a bachelor's degree, all while growing a small business focused on rental properties. So for those of you who are out there looking to buy and hold or even buy, fix and sell, um, uh, Senator Corey McRae, he, he, he knows it. He's lived this lifestyle. Uh, uh, you've got four beautiful children. Uh, you've got a beautiful wife and you're continuing to do great and amazing work to this day. Um, some of the the big, uh, you know, you, you're obviously a very busy person. Um, you can see here some of the current assignments that, that, that you're on the 2020 majority whip, deputy majority whip, excuse me, 2019 budget and taxation committee, 2019 capital budget subcommittee, 2019 health and human services subcommittee, the pensions subcommittee, the joint audit and evaluation committee, the joint committee on, you know, you're, you're, you're out there, man. You're out there and you have been consistently out there for quite some time. So um, I said it earlier before everybody joined and I wanna say it again, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's a very busy time for you, especially while you're in session and taking time in this evening uh, away from your family in order to, to bless us and continue to help provide information and knowledge uh, to those who are looking to, to, to do the positive work of pushing Baltimore forward. Man, I appreciate you, brother. And, and just, you know, I'm born and raised in this city, love this city, and just love the work that you all are doing. I'm ready to jump into any type of questions that you all want to get into. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So first, I want to um, address some of the things that, that folks oftentimes think about when they think about Baltimore City. Um, and one of those is going to be public safety, mm -hmm. right? That's a big ticket item that a lot of people who are looking to move into the city, who are looking to build yep. businesses and community in the city, they look at it and they say, ah, heard about the wire, or I've heard about um, the lack of resources. What is your take on public safety? You know what, public safety is one of the biggest issues. I just wanna start by saying, first, I'm a stakeholder. I believe in my city. If I didn't believe in my city, I wouldn't be right here raising my family of four uh, from that standpoint. When I think about public safety, I'm thinking about my daughter, Kennedy, that catches the bus to go to school. I'm thinking about Reagan. I'm thinking about CJ and Bryson, two black young boys, and just thinking about, but I also know that the city has a lot to teach our young folks. I also know that the city was what raised me from that standpoint. So some of the things that we're thinking about from a public safety standpoint or just implement it. One of the bigger things is, is that I think about all of the liquor stores that we have um, uh, in the city of Baltimore, but specifically I'm gonna name uh, some, uh, a one mile radius for you. North Avenue, down to uh, McAldry Street, to Luzerne, to Central. What we did in those uh, specific, that one mile radius was, we looked at the murders that and the shootings that had take place within those 23 liquor stores at there. So if you all are familiar with like Milton and Biddle um, right there, M&Ms, they had had 29 shootings in a three year period. If you are familiar with Big Bills right there, Carolina and Preston, they had 19 murders in a three year period. What we did was we looked at when the hours of operation. So they were operating from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. And if you all notice, anybody that patronized them, the hours have changed. The hours have changed now to 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. And what we found, especially during that 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. hour, we've seen like a 200 percent drop in reference to violent crime within a 500 foot radius of those locations. What do I mean by that? So the folks that know like Milton and Biddle, they know it ain't too much that's right there. So the corner store that was closed, K's is closed. Um, the, the houses have been knocked down. So the only thing that we have at there is that liquor store that's kind of causing challenges. But we've seen a very much a shift in gears. And one of the things that I also think about is our babies. So let's say that you go to Lily Mae Carroll and you live on like uh, Caroline in um, North Avenue. That kid walks past three stores, three liquor stores before the school bell rang. 
And I don't think that that's the message that we want to send to our young babies, especially that we value or prioritize getting liquor before they even get to school at eight o'clock and that school bell rang. So we changed that piece of it. We changed it in 2020. We're reaping the benefits of uh, uh, changing that into 2020. Some of the other things that we think about, especially this year. So this year we have legislation in thinking about how do our courts, how do our uh, uh, um, Department of Public Safety, which is our pre-trial release, how do they communicate with our police department in reference to the folks that's released? At Baltimore City is very unique because we do not control our pretrial. The state of Maryland does that. Every other jurisdiction, if you're in Baltimore County, Baltimore County controls their police department and their pretrial release. So they're already coordinating. They already have this information. We've got a bill in to change that because Baltimore City is in a very unique situation where the uh, uh, pretrial isn't even communicating with the police department. The second thing that we're thinking about is our parole and probation. When we look at a lot of the people that are victims of homicides and non-fatal shootings, one third of them are under the purview of parole and probation. And I'm specifically focusing on the people that are dealing with non-fatal shootings. We know that if a person gets shot, there's a very high uh, opportunity or, of retaliation and we wanna intervene, we wanna interrupt that uh, uh, retaliation. So we make sure that we're focusing on parole or probation to make sure that they can think about what does the after action plan look like. But when we do have people that are victims of, victims of violence um, that's under their purview, we're making sure that they set measurable goals in reference to how do we drop crime or murders and non-fatal shootings for the folks that's under their purview. And the third thing, especially today, I was able to talk with uh, parole or probation. We have over 200,000 active warrants. 200,000 active warrants in the state of Maryland. In the state of Maryland, there's about 40,000 active warrants in the city of Baltimore. And we wanna set up a fund with the Governor's Office of Crime Prevention to make sure that we're going after, we go after folks that have the, the high violent crime and get them off the street, but there are middle crimes that have open active warrants that we also should be pursuing and thinking about how, because that can also help with the drop in crime. But public safety is one of our bigger issues um, in the city of Baltimore and just want to let everybody know and feel confident that their Baltimore City Senate delegation is looking at this very closely, putting forward things, to, uh, measures to make sure that we can drop um, the level of violence that we're seeing in our city and how do we measure goals, assess, and then take another look at it. Wow, wow, wow. So from protecting our babies, walking through, walking down the street, looking at stores that are, that are uh, you know, they're, they're, they're sin, stores um, uh, before they even start start school all the way to legislation on 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 crime and ensuring that um, um, you know all of the wow it's just you're you're doing a lot <laughs> and, and I'm gonna I'm lean back in on this it's important to recognize that no other jurisdictions the other 23 jurisdictions they do not have the concentration of liquor stores that we do in the city of Baltimore but they also did not have the hours of operation so Folks don't stay open until 2 a.m. in uh, Carroll County, Harford County, things of that nature. And I get that we're urban jurisdiction, but 6 a.m. is very early to be open and, and thinking about what you're going to be drinking versus anything else that's productive. Yeah, no, I, I 100 percent agree. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up kids also. Um, let's talk a little bit about education also. Now, but, but before we jump into this, I do want to share with those who are on, on Zoom tonight. Um, if you have questions, please throw them in the chat. We will have a Q&A at the end uh, where your questions will be, be answered. For those of you who would like to, to ask the questions directly, um, uh, you can feel free to turn your camera on and raise your hand and we will take those questions one by one to ensure that uh, as many questions get, get answered as, as possible. Um, now, when it comes to education, um, that's, that's another piece of the puzzle. We're just gonna jump right into that too. Um, uh, Baltimore City schools have been seen um, nationally and sometimes even internationally as, as a struggling system. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, a, a very strong proponent. Uh, I, I, I went to Baltimore City schools when I was in elementary and middle school. Um, uh, I've seen a lot of my friends and family members go through Baltimore City schools um, uh, and they have done very, very well. Um, but talk to me about some of the, uh, some of the things that are happening there. Yep. So education is another main driver in reference to how do we address some of the uh, challenges that we have in the city, the historical challenges that we have in the city. I think that it's important that I lean in and start how you started. So I'm a graduate of Baltimore City Public Schools. 
Uh, I've faced a lot of challenges going through our school. So I went to Rockno Heights for elementary. I went to West Baltimore Middle. I went to Chickapin, Winston, Emerson, Northern, and I graduated from the two, which was Fairmont Harford right there at Harford the 25th. Um, so, so I faced my challenges going through our schools. I tell folks that luckily I had a mother that never gave up on her son. Um, she sent me through a five-year apprenticeship program where she reached out to the Department of Labor and said, send me every apprenticeship program in the state of Maryland. She said, Corey, go fill out applications. And I was accepted into the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. And through that, I was able to uh, move myself from the four by four block neighborhoods that I knew because I didn't, I wasn't exposed to much. I didn't know much. I couldn't see anything outside of that. And what happens is I got around a bunch of folks that was doing different things. They had uh, businesses, they had houses. And I realized I was like, these folks ain't no smarter than I am. And I just duplicated what I saw and I just think I knew I knew how to do that, get money illegally, but I just need to figure out how to do it legally. And that's when I got into buying houses. So I just recycled. I saved my money up. I saved four or five grand up every year. And every year I would buy a house. And then some some years I ended up starting to buy two houses. So, like, I know that this isn't hard. I know that that all our young folks need to do is see these examples and be real life examples. And then they can mimic the same thing that they're witnessing every day. I'm gonna go back to K through 12 education. I started off with myself going through our K through 12 system. My kids are also in public school education. I got a ninth grader, a seventh grader, uh, uh, first grade and a kindergartner. And, and the reality is, is that they're all thriving in our public school system, but that's not the story for all of our babies. And that's what we have to make a reality. I, we face significant challenges in the city of Baltimore and these are historical challenges. So they will not be solved Today, they will not be solved tomorrow, but the reality is, is that I know that if I do the work that I'm supposed to, I can lay a strong foundation for the folks that come after me. What am I talking about? I'm talking about our buildings are one of the greatest challenges that we have um, in the city of Baltimore. We just did 23, um, our goal is 28. We actually got an infusion of money last year in the General Assembly to be able to work on Western, Poly, Douglas, city and uh, uh, Emerson is now being added to that list. So we're starting off and, and adding five high schools to compound on the 28 new schools that we're gonna be doing. But there, but there are also other challenges. We got Bernard Harris that's not gonna be new. We got Collington that's not gonna be new. We got Tench Tillman that's not gonna be new. And we have to also address the issues at these schools simultaneously as we're addressing them right there. And this is not just a couple hundred million that we're talking about. These are billion, that 21st century was a billion dollar uh, project. This last infusion that we did was about $600 million that we're doing for those six high schools. So like these, be, be, this is a lot of cash and a lot of challenges that we're doing. Once we move past the buildings piece of it, now we have just a, a, a learning piece of it. We, I, I do believe in Dr. Sanolisis. I think that one of the things that she wasn't as strong on apprenticeships as I was, but from an academic standpoint, she was trying her best to prepare our educators and making sure that she could build strong leadership from a principal level. And then that thrives from a teacher. This pandemic knocked away all those gains. And we were making gains like 3%, 4%. And folks were laughing at that. Oh, it ain't happening fast enough. But this pandemic, from a state of Maryland perspective, the learning loss that we're going to endure, we're, we're, we're affected and impacted another generation from this piece of it. What the General Assembly tried to do from an academic standpoint, we did what we call uh, the blueprint for Maryland success. This is the, the Kerwin Commission for folks that have been paying attention to it. It, fo it focused on five pillars. It focused on areas of concentration of poverty. We do know that Baltimore City and a number of our schools, there is significant. When you see 70, 80 percent levels of concentration of poverty, that is not normal. That is not something that 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 is typical from that standpoint. We focused on college readiness and CTE. Um, so making sure that our young folks can think about what does their life look like after uh, uh, K through 12, if, whether they wanna go or whether they don't wanna go. We focused on ESA. We know that we have a number of uh, English as a second language uh, uh, young people and we have to put the money and the resources that's necessary to go behind that. We also focused on our teachers. We think about our biologists, we think about our doctors, we think about our lawyers, but one of the greatest professions that you can do is teach a young person in K through 12 because they're eventually gonna be our doctors, our lawyers and things of that nature. So we have to focus on that. So from a, a, a building standpoint, we did 21st century schools and continuing to do that work. And then from an academic standpoint, we're doing the Carolyn Commission to kind of work at this. But I tell you, we're in reality, the learning loss that has been ca caused and, and you got to think like my kids are going to be okay. So they have the resources, they have, 
they're going to do okay. But it's not my kids. It's the kids that um, they don't have someone watching to make sure that they jump on when they were home for the last 18 months. The only meal that they get sometimes is the meal that they have at school. We don't get to see whether they're being abused because so many of our young people and the teachers are typically the ones that report those types of things. So like those are all things that we lose when we're at that hub and we have to think about and glad that we're moving back in that direction. And it was very contentious and very controversial when we talked about opening up schools. I was one of the people that said, hey, we do need to open up schools. And I get the health piece of it, but I knew that the young people that needed those schools the most we're going to be suffering at Eva a greater challenge because of the things that we couldn't see because they were home. Like I said, my kids are going to be good. Khalil, your kids are going to be good. But we have to think about how do we move the ball with everybody moving with us. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I want to go back to one of the things you said. There are 28 or 30, 33 schools that are being worked on that are in the pipeline. Um, uh, what, what, what exactly is going to be done to, to those schools? Are we talking about building improvements? Are we talking about technology no, and so books? So, so they, they were knocked down and they were rebuilt. I'm going to start throwing some names out there so that they know what I'm talking about. Fort Worthington, anybody that knows school number 85 know that Fort Worthington just got rebuilt about three, four years ago. Um, Harper Heights right there at North and Broadway, that's a brand new school. Reaches in my old school. I told you about the two. So right there, Harper and 25th, those are all brand new schools. That's specifically my district, but this has been going on across the city of Baltimore. You see these schools knocked down. And if they didn't get knocked down, Khalil, it's been a heavy, heavy renovation where uh, you can see the difference, the improvement. We shouldn't have schools where kids can't drink out the water fountains. We shouldn't have schools where kids are thinking about the ceiling, where this, the heat isn't coming on, whether the air conditioner isn't working, things of that nature. And we're working our hardest to make sure that we address those. But the reality is, is also that we have 23 other jurisdictions that we have to negotiate with. So when we think people care about Baltimore, that's not true. They're also thinking about what does this bring to my jurisdiction and how am I going to eat in this situation? And it's not just the Republican Democrat thing. Sometimes you got Democrats that don't always want to have Baltimore City sitting at the table or maybe saying that Baltimore City is getting too much. What about us? Mm, 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 mm. An advocate, a proponent, a champion for Baltimore City. The, the newest school, I believe, in East Baltimore, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's on the border of, of your district, just inside your district, Henderson Hopkins School. Is, it, is that correct? So Henderson Hopkins was done a little bit different. That was like a public-private partnership. Okay. Um, it's, it's like, a, it's not a charter school, but it's like a quasi charter school. And Principal Cannon is doing a phenomenal job down there, uh, especially right there in the heart of uh, some of our challenges. But like that school is doing what he's supposed to do. And I appreciate Principal Cannon. I'm going to lift him up because this was a guy that came and was in management and dropped back to be a principal. So this was the guy that saw it at all the highest of highest levels. He served on the school board. He had, he had, he had worked in the business world. And then he came back to work with our babies and be the principal. And that's why that school is thriving because they have serious leadership. And then what, what you find is the teachers uh, uh, stay and then you create that longevity, not high turnover because they know that they have a phenomenal leader to follow. So principal Cannon is doing a phenomenal job down there at, uh, uh, Henderson Hopkins, but I got all types of schools. You can uh, go down there with Principal Samuels down there at Tench Tillman. While she don't have a fancy new building, she's a four-star school right in the heart of a many, many challenges. Yes. Um, uh, 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 right there, you had uh, Dr. Drummond, but you now have Principal Pouncey up at Hamilton, four-star school right here. And, and when I say four, it's only five stars in, in that MSDE grade them by, but those are four-star schools right here in the heart of the 50, 45th. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Talk to me about some of your highlights from from last year's session, and then I also want to talk about some of the uh, the, the the legislation that you're pushing for th this year. If you can share, yeah, you know what? So, like, the reality is is that there's so much work to do in Baltimore City, Khalil. Like, I worked on some big stuff, but like at the end of the day, once you won the won the battle, it's another battle to fight. Mm. So, I can talk about voting rights. I can talk about. 40,000 people that were on parole or probation that got the first time and right to vote because of the work that we did in 2015. And that first time that they got the right to vote, it was in 2016. I can talk about the minimum wage. I can talk about how I saw my mother work two or three jobs. I can say, hey, when I was walking myself to school at seven, eight years old because she had already went to work and I had to walk myself home because she didn't come home from work till about six or seven o'clock uh, from that standpoint. And knowing that people should be making a decent wage because that's other, it's other impacts. It impacts your mental health. It impacts the young people that are around, whether you have a family or things of that nature. So we made sure that the minimum wage, we did voting rights. We also worked on um, transportation. Transportation is one of the biggest issues. Senate Bill 199 last year, 
injected $2 billion. This was major, $2 billion into our uh, CTP, our tra MTA transportation system to deal with our buses, our light rail, our subway. And when I say deal with them, I'm talking about the maintenance, making sure that they don't just keep shutting down. If they keep shutting down, people ain't getting to school, people ain't getting to work, people ain't getting the fresh food and things of that nature. Like, I, I feel like I, we did about 25 bills that really, really impact. But at the end of the day, it's so much work to do in the city of Baltimore. It's like you get the W and then you keep going to the next W. One of the bigger issues that I'm working with this year is, is uh, fresh food. So in a number mm, of my okay. neighborhoods, I keep losing my supermarket. So we used to have Super Pride right there on Harford Avenue. Yep. I just lost my supermarket in Church Square. So I have like a million dollar capital subsidy. They're doing a new project down there at PSO. For folks that don't know, it's Perkins, Somerset, Old Town. Right there at Old Town, they want to put a new supermarket. I'm like, bring it. So we're going to provide as the state a million dollar subsidy because we need fresh food in East Baltimore. And that is one of my priorities. And I'm going to be, the work hasn't happened. Like we're in the cutting edge of it, but I'm going to be very proud when we look up um, and see a supermarket that our folks over at Latrobe, our folks over at Old Town, our folks in Berea can be proud of and be able to shop and have fresh food. So my, my brother-in-law lives in Broadway East and um, there's a gentleman who he sees, an elderly gentleman, and he can only carry so many bags at, at a time, but he walks from the uh, the supermarket down off of either Madison or M Monument all the way up yep. to Broadway East um, uh, almost every day in order to get certain supplies that he needs to, to, to live. Uh, you know, it's, 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 almost, it's almost criminal, the, the, the level of food insecurity um, uh, and food deserts that, that that exists throughout the city. So thank you for being an advocate for that. Um, uh, one thing that I, I wanna shift, shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about, about housing here um, and development, real estate, construction, those types of things. Uh, uh, you know, We use the MHT small commercial tax credit for a lot of our, our houses. Um, I was able to, uh, to testify uh, for the Maryland House as well as the, uh, uh, the Maryland State, State Senate on behalf of House uh, uh, SB 289. Uh, the historic revitalization tax credit. Um, just a little background for everybody here. The uh, the the, the uh, Maryland historic tax credit program had a stopgap of about a million dollars, um, and by uh, from July first, when when the the new fiscal year started, to about September, all of the dollars had been uh, accounted for. Um, so at this point, you know, there's 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 no additional dollars, there's no stopgap, and that really prohibits folks like myself, like all of you, um, from being able to do the positive work in developing communities to get rid of vacant houses and turn them into homes. Um, talk to me, Senator McCray, about how passing this bill could could impact the residents in 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 your district as well as the greater Maryland area. Yep. And Khalil, if I can, I'm going to go back to the basics and use this as an educating opportunity because sometimes folks may not know and I want to make sure I bring everybody with me. So people think that elected officials pay attention to everybody. That's not true. They pay attention to people that vote and they pay attention to neighborhoods that vote. And then we also think that neighborhoods just got to be great just because like, hey, it's a whole bunch of people that make decent incomes and that's why this neighborhood is thriving in the way that it did. That's not true. Reality is, is that they built up a certain amount of capital and they're able to leverage their power to get to local, state, federal dollars and bring those resources back to their neighborhoods. Because our elected officials historically have never been intentional, you find places like Darley Park, South Clifton Park, New Broadway East, Berea that's been left behind because those folks don't have the organization, they don't have the bandwidth, and they don't have the, uh, the relationships to kind of leverage those tax dollars to come back into their neighborhoods. Reality is that everybody pay taxes, uh, Khalil. <laughs> so every time that you think about it, it could be the Maryland Historic Tax Credits. It could be Bernie, what we call uh, Baltimore Regional Neighborhood Initiative. It could be community legacy dollars. It could be local bond initiatives. It could be so many different things. And we have to make sure that, especially as elected officials, we're intentional about getting these subsidies back especially in the neighborhoods that have been historically disinvested um, uh, in. So the, when you talk about the Maryland Historic Tax Credit, that's one of the vehicles that we can have to make sure that we can pipe to get back in neighborhoods to do levels of development in. I talked about Bernie, I talked about community legacy, but there are a number of these different vehicles. And that's just from a housing standpoint. You also have subsidy from an open space. When you mm -hmm. think about what does your parks look like? 
What do your libraries look like? What do the small business uh, uh, tax credits or things of that nature look like within those neighborhoods? These are the things that we have to be making sure touch every last neighborhood when we're making these decisions because that's not what takes place um, uh, from that standpoint. So first, I just wanna salute you for coming down to testify. And, and I'll, I'll lift that piece up. Most people are intimidated by the legislative process. So they don't really engage with city hall. They don't really engage with the state legislature. They don't really engage with their federal government. I, and, and, and me being one of them, I tell folks that I've known my wife, Demetria, since I was 16. As soon as Demetria turned 18, she went out and started voting. I didn't start voting until I was in my mid 20s, late 20s, because I didn't understand how government worked and that it impacts and affects everything that we do. Whether that's your BGE lights going out and whether they come back on in two days or two weeks, that elected official has something to do with that. What do your roads look like? What do your schools look like? What do your higher education institutions look like? So. I, I ran for office because I'd never been in that level of government. But what I did was I knew that I had a will. I knew I wanted to serve my people and I knew I had a work ethic um, to make sure that we serve and do what we're supposed to do uh, uh, by the city. But once again, you you you, you raised the question, but I, I, I kind of like uh, went off key here, but the Merlin historical tax credit was a major thing to make sure that the small developers, not just the big commercial developers, the most small developers have a pot of money that they can seek to make sure that this is a gap, the gap that you have in reference to producing these home ownership opportunities can be there and help fill and make our city thrive. Yeah, and that's that's the point, making this this city thrive. Everybody plays a role. You play a role, I, I play a role. We all play a role in pushing the city forward. The role that we have selected is to eliminate vacant pro properties and to build homes for people, providing safety, security, um, and preventing kids from walking past vacant houses, boarded up houses, deterioration, decade after decade from when they were born all the way until their 20s and 30s, basically feeling like nobody cares right mm -hmm. over over that amount of time um uh so development is huge for for, for us um uh, development in the 45th district development in baltimore city both on the residential side as well as the commercial side talk to me about some of the things that that, that you're seeing and then we're going to open it up for q a so one of the things i i, I should i it's so many things i want to talk about so for folks that may not know how the legislature works, um, there's 141 people in the Maryland House of Delegates. There's 47 people in the Maryland State Senate. Together, they call us the Maryland General Assembly. I have the fortunate opportunity. I got my training wheels in the House of Delegates, so I did serve four years in the House, and then I decided to run for the Maryland State Senate. But I get to sit on what we call the Budget and Taxation Committee. It's four committees, JPR, Finance, EE, but I sit on the Budget and Taxation Committee. Imagine being one of 13 people being able to chop up a $58 billion budget is so just an important responsibility, but a greater opportunity to be very, very intentional about what that looks like. I have the unique opportunity to be able to serve as the subcommittee chair for what we call public safety, transportation, and environment. That being a subcommittee chair then puts me in the back of the room, which now gets to about six people chopping up a $58 billion budget, which is a very, very great responsibility. But when you think about like what does the development look like in uh, the 45th legislative district, um, I've been in this office. This will be my fourth. This is my fourth session as the Maryland State Senator. And I know that I have a plan for my Hoffa Road corridor. I know that I have a plan for like neighborhoods like four by four EBDI. Uh, I, we talked about Old Town. We talk about uh, Greenmount West, Johnson Square. Like I know the plans and I can see the vision in reference to these respective neighborhoods. I'll also speak the way my challenges are because I don't think you should just talk about what you have good, but talk about some of the challenges. Some of the challenges are New Broadway East and what we're trying to do with New Broadway East, right there at North and Broadway, we have the Gauntlet's building, trying to make sure that we bring in a strong anchor to kind of make sure that we light up that street and put more feet on the street, the way we can get some more activity at North and Broadway. But New Broadway East is one of my challenges. Dolly Park is one of my challenges. If for folks that drive past Hoffa Road, we did a little park called the Gateway Park right there at Harford and Normal. But the reality is, is that we have so much more work and that was just a small gesture in reference to what we could do. Uh, Berea is another place where I have to figure it out um, and make sure that we address the issues that plague those communities historically for decades on top of decades on top of decades. How does someone in my position change the trajectory of a neighborhood? I'll talk about what we call the four by four. So for folks mm -hmm. that's familiar with Northeast Baltimore, 
you have this neighborhood called the four by four. It's four streets. It's Lindale, Emily, Elmore, and Ravenwood. In those four streets, we've injected about $3 million in about a two year period with nonprofits to help beef up um, the activity, the housing development, so that we can subsidize. That's what we need. We need some subsidy to help with home ownership in those neighborhoods. We've pushed that money to organizations such as NEHA, um, Northeast Housing Initiative. We also push it to St. Ambrose um, and, and uh, Habitat for Humanity. So we look for these uh, partners the way we know that they have the right intentions, the right will to do the thing and to do the right thing and also have a historical track record to go in and help us. Because what, what you'll find is when that activity start, when success breeds more success. So other folks are then gonna come in and wanna do development because they know that that area is, is tinkering in the right direction uh, from that standpoint. And we're doing that all throughout our respective neighborhoods and a lot of them just making sure that that subsidy hit in the way that it's supposed to hit. Make sure you all follow Senator Corey McRae at C-O-R-Y-M-C-C-R-A-Y on Instagram uh, uh, to, to continue learning about how he is working on behalf of Baltimore City, on behalf of the community, the citizens, to continue pushing Baltimore forward. Uh, I'd love to open it up for question and answer at this time. I see a few in the chat. I'm going to jump in there. Uh, we're going to do this two ways. Uh, one, if you have a question that you would like me to ask on your behalf, please throw those in the chat on Zoom. Um, uh, those of you who are watching from Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, um, uh, please stand by uh, for, for additional opportunities later uh, to, add, to, to ask, ask questions. Um, uh, for those who are on Zoom, if you would like to ask your question directly to Senator Corey McRae, uh, please turn your camera on, raise your, choose the raise hand function at the bottom uh, of the screen, uh, and we will uh, 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 get your question asked. asked. Um, so starting with uh, a question around schools, what specific strategies are in place to enhance the quality of teaching and learning and support struggling school leaders? So we talked about early on in the session in reference to the blueprint for Maryland's future, um, what we know is the Carroll Commission, making sure that we double down on areas that have concentration of poverty, making sure that we double down on English as a second language, making sure that we double down on CTE, um, and, and college readiness and making sure that we also support our teachers within the classroom. Uh, what, what does that look like? Um, uh, that looks like making sure that we have the extra investment, so the extra resources to be able to help um, those schools that face the challenges where they have a high population of students that need that, uh, those resources or success. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Next question. Um, I'm interested in understanding where's the nearest agriculture operation that supplies Baltimore with fresh produce slash food? Is there farmland near nearby? Is there uh, some kind of urban farm available to help uh, uh, provide fresh food? You know what? So we've done a we've done some work around urban uh, farming. Um, last year, I passed the bill called Soil Conservation um, Soil Conservation Districts. This was one where we saw that federal money was being passed through to our local jurisdictions and Baltimore City wasn't getting it uh, because we didn't have a soil conservation district. I didn't notice it was a young lady named Atia Wells who had an urban farm right there in the uh, Frankfurt uh, community. And unfortunately, she had to go outside of Baltimore City to get the technical assistance um, that was necessary for her to thrive with her urban farm. We changed that. We passed the bill, said no, not only are we going to go for the federal resources, but we're also going to um, uh, uh, have that right here so nobody has to go out. The other piece is uh, we also have another bill that deals with urban farming to make sure that the University of Maryland, uh, the, it's like an extension, it's a grant, um, the land grant uh, that works on these things, that they have the uh, employees or the amount of staff necessary to be able to help and step out, especially for folks with more um, uh, technical assistance. But from a fresh food standpoint, my main goal and what I've been trying to do is just go after a supermarket. We got bodegas, we got corner stores and things of that nature, but we do need fresh food. I've tried a couple creative ways. Um, I did a subsidy right there at uh, uh, Harford and um, Harford Avenue for a couple hundred thousand and wasn't able to the bank on that, um, the 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 uh, the folks decided to go in a different. The, uh, the person that owned the land decided to go in a different direction. And the reality is, is that you have to try. I have to shoot my shot. If I don't hit my shot, I just need to figure out what do I do different. I've also tried uh, working with um, uh, the Klein family. They have a supermarket right there off of Liberty Road. 
I, I just can't think of uh, what it's called, but he talked about like the challenges of having an urban supermarket because they own a bunch of different supermarkets and, and some of the things. So one of the unique ideas that I had was there is a revenue generator from beer and wine in supermarkets. So like if they were willing to move in a very a food desert is what we call it, that they will be able to offer that up. The General Assembly isn't there yet. Uh, I want to say majority over 40 states already do things like this. Um, but, but this time I went in this year and we're going to be very successful with this one. Um, that million dollar subsidy that I was talking about at old town to make sure that we lure in, um, uh, a, a supermarket right there. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to go to, um, our first question from the audience here, Nicole, I see your hand is up. Thank you for having your camera on. Uh, I'm going to unmute you and you can ask your question. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. Thank you for um, joining us tonight, Senator McCray. Um, I just wanted to ask: um, Is there any concern with investors coming in the city, investing in the city, but for the wrong reasons? Um, like, for example, displacing that community, and that community, and in the end of the renovations, not reflecting, you know, what that community actually is. Nicole. So, yeah. You're absolutely right in reference that we have to also be equally mindful of who we're giving resources to and what does that look like. And it's a couple of different ways. One of the things that's disheartening to me is, is let's say that you have a private property that's challenging inside of the neighborhood. It takes about two years for the city of Baltimore to actually do um, uh, uh, get that property to get them to even address the issues and fix it up or because they can just sit on it. A lot of times folks are just sitting on the property and it's just a hindrance for that respective neighborhood. So that's the, the time frame in which it takes to uh, kind of address those issues is like very disheartening. It's one of the things that really, really frustrate me. So we do have a lot of absentee um, uh, owners of properties that we should figure be figuring out how to get them to move or incentivize them with the carrot or the stick to address those issues. And then you also had developers that come in and as you stated, may displace um, uh, neighbors and that's not what we want also. And one of the folks that I think about that's doing it from a holistic standpoint, because I, I, I yell about this because uh, sometimes we have developers and I'm gonna be very honest with you, Nicole, the developer is typically white. The uh, agency that many of our state agency heads are white. Um, our, uh, typically our Baltimore City Housing Agency is white. So you have all of these white folks that's making decisions in black neighborhoods without even notifying the legislator, let alone the community, but not notifying the legislator and hiding behind different issues. And I find that very, very frustrating and I actually have a bill in Senate Bill 46 that kind of looks at uh, uh, that piece of it. But there are developers that's handling it from a holistic standpoint. What does that look like? I think about this group that we have, they've done work in Oliver, they've done work in Greenmount West, and they're currently in Johnson Square, they're called Rebuild Metro. And Rebuild Metro has bought up liquor stores, so they they basically bought the license and they've extinguished it. So they didn't sell it to anybody, they just got rid of the respective uh, license. They worked on housing from a rental standpoint and from a home ownership standpoint. They've also uh, looked at the parks. So we know that even when the house is one component, but the green space, what are the amenities that you have that, that folks can uh, actually enjoy um, and things of that nature. So I really, really do enjoy working with a Rebuild Metro. I think that I wish that that was a, a model that we can just duplicate and create all across the city. The challenge is, is that typically if we find something good, they we try to ramp it up and the bandwidth just isn't there. And then all of a sudden we're diluting the work that they actually do or you're trying to mimic it, duplicate it, and it's just not gonna be that same type of model because it's probably not the same thoughtful people um, that's there. So there are folks, and I also just wanna lift up uh, Khalil, like he's very a very intentional brother, him and his wife um, about it. And like, we have to figure out how do we build up folks like that of the city, from the city, wanna do the right thing. And that's what I'm all about. Thank you, Nicole, for your question. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, Sean Klauski, Michael Batum, the team over at Rebuild Metro doing fantastic work. Um, Mona, I see that you had your hand up as well. Thank you for turning your camera on. Uh, you're up. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, 
I actually have a little history with uh, Senator McCray. Thank you so much, Senator McCray. Um, I've worked with you in the past. Um, I represent um, Rising Zion Baptist Church, and we're here in East Baltimore. We've been doing work here for probably 40, almost like 40 years in East Baltimore. And um, I have other clients like Rising Zion with properties um, where they're doing things in, in the city. And for example, one issue I just reached out to Senator McCray for was that um, we have some properties that the city came and demolished um, and the way they did it, they would not really hear my church's position about, you know, the, the position, the condition of the properties. And now we're trying to resolve these issues with the city. And it's just been going years and years and years to the point where I spent hours down at the city buildings like Fayette Street everywhere and no answers. Right. So I have other clients that own properties here in, you know, in Baltimore City that we're trying to move. Investors may want to buy them or just other citizens of Baltimore want to buy the properties. But the processes that the city um, government takes us through from the deeds office to the transfer tax office, even now is just unbelievable to get these properties to move. So what we're trying to do, and I reached out to you, um, Senator McCray, I'm asking you, what if we I mean, and you're, you have sent emails, you know, on our behalf, asking the city to address the issues that I brought up to your office. And they're going on for years and years and years. Does the city, what what have you gotten from the city as far as what they want to do with these properties? Because it seems to me if they really want these vacants to go, they will remove these ridiculous liens off the properties and allow investors and even just the Baltimore City residents who are also professionals and business um, business people that really that are now investors that want to move these properties but we're not getting the cooperation of the city even now like I have a deed you know I have properties that I moved and they even just getting the lien sheet simply I had to demand that they email them to me simple things like that it's just causing the processes to go months and months and months before um, they're addressed and it's just getting you know it's a little unbearable it's a little frustrating um, and then you have to deal with liens that come after the fact while these while these properties are in the process of being moved. And it's just it's just unbelievable what the city has taken us through. So have you seen what have you seen and what's going to be the answer to that if if we if they continue to take us through these um, unreasonable process? Well, first, just thank you uh, for the work that you do. I want to lean in just to make sure, like I say, use it as an educate educating opportunity. So. For folks that know, like you got local government, you got state government, you got federal government. A lot of the issues that she's talking about is from a local standpoint. I, I represent on a state standpoint. The challenge is, is that most people know who their mayor is. They know who their governor is. But if you ask them who their council person, delegate, state senator is, they probably wouldn't be able to tell you majority of folks. And when they call, they have an issue. So they don't care what level of government you serve. They want their issue addressed from that standpoint. So whenever somebody reaches out, I don't care if it's a local, state, or federal issue. I want to intervene because I know that people are apathetic about government and the best way to build trust is by doing. So what do I do in those types of situations is I'll reach out to the respective agency. Um, and the agency that you're we're talking about was Baltimore City Housing. Um, I typically will forward, the, I'll ask people to say, hey, send it to me in writing. What I'll do is I'll forward it to the respective person and ask for an answer. If that person doesn't give me an answer, I'll keep going to the level of the top until I make it to maybe like the commissioner, Alice Kennedy, uh, from that standpoint. If Alice Kennedy wasn't able to address the issues that I need, I then would just go to the, directly to the mayor's office and say, hey, I got to get a response. We have to figure out a path forward uh, for, the, for this issue. Let me be clear, the city is in, um, an, have a number of issues. I wanna say that COVID-19 only compounded the issues that we've had and kind of made them drag out a little bit more because folks were working from home. The, the, uh, the, the impact of the workload that was being done isn't being done at the same capacity and things of that nature. But what I would typically do is I would forward that email to the respective agency. I would give them enough time to respond. Typically, I give them about seven to 10 days. We then follow up. Um, and then if we weren't able to get the response, we would then try to convene a meeting. I will say that it gets a little bit. So my job, my, the main important part of the work that I do is during a 90 day session. This is where we have to watch the budget. I talked to you about a $58 billion budget. 
We've got 25 bills in and being able to navigate all that within that 90 day space. So right now I'm like in the game. This is where I make my bread and butter and be able to go back the next nine months to be able to talk about what we do. So the level of, uh, I'm always responsive. So anybody says something to me, know that I do uh, respond back. But the reality, I can't do my meetings at the capacity that I want to do because I'm always in committee and things of that nature. That's from January, uh, the second month, second Wednesday of January, we get out the second Monday of uh, April, and then I'm back to normal in reference to that, just making sure that we push and represent the city in the manner that it deserves. Mona, thank you for your question. We, we appreciate it. So we've got five minutes left, six minutes left. Uh, we've got time for one more question. I try to do uh, fast responses too. I'll try to like give the 30, 45 second version. Versus perfect. Thank you. And I ask that anybody who's asking a question, please also uh, ask your question quickly. We're going to prioritize those who have had their hands raised and their video on uh, in next gen, followed by those who are submitting questions or from next gen. Uh, uh, and then those who are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube, apologies. Um, uh, your, your questions will not get answered tonight, but make sure you follow Senator McCray. Uh, 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 reach out to him di directly. He and his team will, will be sure to respond. Bakari, you're up. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Senator, for meeting with us. Um, my name is Bakari. Um, I'm a, a new resident of Baltimore, as well as with the new city planner with the city of Baltimore. Um, one thing I've noticed is that we have a you have a lot of corridors here, and especially with a lot of vacant and boarded up buildings and that are mixed use. So um, with your experience with being um, with the Senate, have you have you heard of any kind of corridor improvement zones or corridor incentive zones that would give uh, people who are actually wanting to build up and, and take up some of these vacants um, as far as tax incentives or as far as any kind of incentives to redo the corridors? Yep, so typically what we have in DHCD, we have Bernie typically works on our main corridor. So the Baltimore Regional Neighborhood Initiative that only accounts for Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County are benefactors of Bernie. It's about a $9 million injection from state. You also have a, a neighbor, neighborhood business works. Typically, if businesses are looking for some form of a gap, uh, have, a, have some, they've, they've collected all the dollars, 90% funded, trying to figure out how to get a 10, 15% gap. We have no interest loans. We have things of that nature to try to help them. But that a lot of that money drives on our respective corridors. But, but if, if somebody, if a business owner or somebody that was concerned about doing development, what I would do, I would guide them to uh, Ken Holt over at DHCD and I would do uh, uh, Department of Commerce. Thank you for that answer. And thank you for that question. Uh, Juanita, you are up. Let me get you on and unmute you. Um, thank you for speaking with us tonight, um, Senator McCray. Appreciate it. Um, I definitely appreciate your story. Um, for me, I'm a former educator. I'm currently a nurse, and I'm particularly interested in Western Baltimore, West North Avenue area. And my question is, you know, that is a historically disinvested area. There is not any major anchors there um, to bring in businesses. So like, what is the plan to um, reinvest and redevelop um, Western Baltimore and particularly West North Avenue, you know, neighborhoods like Coppin Heights, Mondalman, Easterwood? Cause yeah, I didn't so hear any of those neighborhoods mentioned. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm there. Like I got so much work over here in East Baltimore that I really don't come out of it, but I do, because I'm in the Senate, I do know what my colleagues are doing. So over there at Coppin Heights, right there where Coppin is, the university is one of the anchors. Um, they actually did the West North Avenue. It's not CDC, but they put something in statue. And what happens is West Senator North Hayes Avenue Redevelopment Jenkins, Authority, who's uh, leading that effort. I know that they've already mm -hmm. kind of started because that was legislation that he did last year. And he's also looking to get that inside of the state budget to make sure that he can drive revenue and resources um, to that West North Avenue court. I do know that that's one of the, his bigger initiatives and visions from that. And he's aligned cop in the help of that. Yeah, if I can shed some light, it's the West North Avenue Development Authority. That's what it is. Yes, I they were formed in, in the fall. Yep. Yes. Yep. Excellent. Thank you, Juanita. S Senator Thank McCray, you if well. you've got time for one more question, I'd love to have uh, uh, Janelle, who has her hand raised and has had it raised for a while, uh, to be able to ask her question. Let me get you unmuted, Janelle. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, thank you for coordinating this and thank you for participating. Um, I want to know what opportunities um, do you see 
working with uh, dev- in investors like us and our small developers um, that are up and coming that we can partner and rebuild the communities. So what areas should we be focused on? You know, some of the things that I think about is first, like we got BDC who's supposed to be working with and, and leaning in, especially like small black minority um, uh, folks. I ask that you engage at the local and the state level in reference because I would direct them um, to be able to understand some of the, the grant funding that come out of DHCD. Also, we partner with, and let's just say if you were on a Hoffa Road corridor, they have Hoffa Road main streets to come in and maybe you can pile under the umbrella, but it is a project that you may be working on. Same thing with uh, uh, EBDI, maybe the same thing with Rebuild Metro. You have uh, Benny over on Bel Air Edison. We have um, Central Baltimore Partnership over in Station North. So a lot of these umbrella organizations typically pool everybody and then they go after different grants um, themselves. And if they had, if you're having funding challenges from that standpoint, uh, let's say that you are looking for opportunity, like find a loan or find something for one of the houses. There's a number of different organizations, whether it's Stanley Tucker, where we, uh, um, he got MMG, where uh, for folk, they get money from the lottery, lottery funds to be able to go specifically to small minority women owned businesses. So a number of those uh, folks are typically, Stanley will send me a letter and say, here's the businesses that's funded uh, from yours. I know that there's a fabric shop on uh, Hoff Road that was a benefactor. It's a number of folks that was a benefactor. So like, if you shot me an email and Khalil, that's how I'll close. I know you've been giving out my handle on Instagram, but like, I really do email. So I got a long email and it's very public. So if you Google Corey McCray emails, it's gonna come up too. But my email is Corey, my name, Corey, C-O-R-Y. There's a period in the middle, McCray, M-C-C-R-A-Y. The, the at symbol senate.state.md.us. I don't answer my own phones, but I do answer each and every email. So I'm looking at every email that comes through there. I may forward it to my staff, but know that I did see the email. My phone number is 410-841-3165. And as stated, my email and the phone number is also public. So if you Google Corey McCray, um, or you could just uh, inbox me, um, DM me on Instagram and my Twitter, my handle is at Corey McCray. I'll make sure to send my email address over and we can get it started. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that info. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, everyone. For those in next gen who are not able to get their questions answered tonight, I'm going to save the chat and make sure that we get these questions over uh, so that uh, someone on, on Senator McCray's team can, can answer them. Thank you, Kyle, for throwing that phone number in the chat. I threw in the, the Instagram handle as well as the email address. Um, for those of you who are not, in next gen get with it get with it you got to get with it because we're out here doing big big things we got folks buying up properties left left and right kiara pulled a report that showed that the last two quarters of 2021 so from the beginning of july to the end of december uh next gen acquired about eight million dollars worth of baltimore city properties nice and our goal and our mission and our, our ethos is to build wealth and build Baltimore, specifically building Blackwell to lower that wealth gap so that we can play on an equitable field. Uh, we can pass uh, uh, assets on to our next generation and we build it. We're building the next generation of, of, of real estate developers right here in Baltimore City. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Senator Corey McRae. We're very excited to, to have you. Um, we're we're going to have a bus tour uh, on, on March the 12th. In 10 days, we have a bus tour that I want to just quickly plug. Um, and we will be going through your district. Uh, we'll be seeing commercial developments, residential developments. We'll be walking through houses, a house that has not started, a house that's halfway finished, a house that is completely finished, so that folks who really want a uh, uh, feet on the ground experience to learn about what's going on in Baltimore City from, from experts, uh, they can absolutely have the opportunity to do so. Um, so thank you again for having us. We, we greatly appreciate it. Um, is there anything final that you want to wrap up and, and Man, say? Just, just thank you for this opportunity. Um, in reference to building our communities, just generational wealth, I tell you, like I've, I've been in real estate for the last 20 years. Bulk of the homes that I own is in Bel Air Edison. And like that is the reason why I'm in a position at this moment, because I feel as though I'm blessed. I feel like God has given me certain levels of talent. And the, and the reality is, is that I thought that success was me making a lot of money. That's not true. Success is how many people I can get across that finish line with me so that they can see the same opportunity. So I say thank you for this opportunity and thank you for all each and every one that I, uh, I met um, tonight. But most importantly, if there's ever an issue, please do not hesitate to send me an email um, so I can jump right on. 
Fantastic. Thank you again. And I'll see everybody uh, another time. Recording stopped. All right, y'all, that's a wrap. This was real. This was a lot of fun. We had a lot of great conversation tonight, learning about the different things that are happening from Senator Corey McRae, who represents the 45th District. Um, uh, this series, uh, Moving Baltimore Forward, I think we're going to keep this thing going. Uh, I think, uh, you know, ultimately, it's all about exposure, not only to education tools, resources, guidance, um, and, and those things, um, but also uh, to local leaders, political leaders, community leaders, um, who are, are absolutely doing the work, not on the, the real estate, the construction, the development side, but also um, on every other front, education, public safety, you heard it all, um, food access, um, uh, so many different things. So uh, very excited to have everybody uh, join us. And we are, um, this is a rat. This is a rat. <laughs>